All right, if you have been at chapel at all in the past week or so, then you may be classically conditioned at this point to think about global outreach anytime you see my face. So hello, good to see you. Uh, You guessed it, we will be talking about outreach at some point this morning. Uh, But I'm excited to get to speak with you about how and why we love and serve people, whether that's locally or globally. All right, so I'm a big fan of countdowns. Um, I'm very future oriented and always thinking about what's coming up or what I can look forward to. I love having trips or events planned. So I'm building anticipation for something always. So I have a few countdowns for us this morning that we can all maybe look forward to together. All right, our first one, there's only 17 days until our mid semester break, amen, yes. I know, what a blessing that is this fall. All right, 64 days until Thanksgiving, which is a very underrated holiday, in my opinion. Only 80 more days until you last semester seniors graduate. That's insane. We have 96 days until Christmas. We're jumping 102 days until the first day of spring, which I need to look forward to because I need that warm weather once the holidays are over. 220 days until the rest of y'all seniors graduate in the spring. Wild, yes, give yourselves a round of applause for that one. And 235 days until our first global outreach team of the summer leaves. I told you it would come up. So I've had to recognize in myself that being too future oriented is not always a good thing for me. I can get busy and forget to reflect on the past or even be present in the current moment too. Because of that, it impacts how I worship and how I serve. So I was struck by something. There's an author and theologian, Robert E. Weber, who wrote a book called Ancient Future Worship. And in it, he makes the point that worship does God's story. So worship meaning not just songs that we sing, but that could also be one format of it but that worship is both a remembrance of God's story and his redemptive work, and it's an anticipation of the future and God's vision for the world. I love that song that we sang earlier this morning, Same God. Uh, I didn't realize that they were singing that song until uh, a little bit after this, but it was just perfect timing, uh, because it gives us that contrast of drawing on the stories of God's faithfulness in scripture and calling on that same faithful God now. Right, we're standing on his faithfulness. So we remember that, we remember that faithfulness and that goodness, and we anticipate that he will continue to reveal and provide now and in the future. So if you were in chapel last Wednesday, then you got to hear from some awesome people about God's faithfulness on their global outreach trips from this past summer. So we wanna celebrate that, we wanna remember it, and now, because of seeing God's goodness and faithfulness over this past summer, we get to have this joyful anticipation for what God will do for this upcoming year. So as I was taking time to actually reflect uh, on my own past experiences, I was thinking about my own times on global outreach trips while I was a student. And God was so sweet to remind me of so many of the ways that he was present and working in each one of those trips. My experience with outreach specifically has been primarily in Asia, so in Cambodia, China, and then several times to India as well. And the work I did in all of them was very different, but the goal was always to love and to serve people well. Whether that was through physically helping an organization with a project, or loving on some kids, or building relationships with people, sharing the good news of Jesus with them. The cultures that I got to experience were so different from the one that I grew up in, and my perspective of God and his kingdom widened on every single trip that I took. I've seen God heal people, I've seen him speak through people in a language that they did not think that they could speak, just so that they could pray with those who didn't understand English. I felt his presence while singing worship songs as everyone in the room sung a language that was different than my own because it showed me how far and wide God's kingdom has already reached. I've seen seeds planted as we shared the gospel with people that had literally never heard of the name of Jesus before. And I felt his love through the hospitality of others as they joyfully welcomed me and opened up their homes. They offered me a meal even though it cost them something. 
These ways in which God works all over the world are the things that I want to be intentional to remember and to praise him for. And as I let my own anticipation build for how he's going to work through all of you next summer, uh, I want us all to learn to be really good at loving and serving people well. So I want us to explore now for a bit how he calls us to be different in how we love and serve people. It's not different from him, but different from the world or what the world expects us or expects from us. So our theme this year, we've talked about it a bit, is different based on Romans 12. And today I want to focus just on verses 9 through 13. So I'm going to read them now and then they should be uh, on the screens as well. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. The first couple verses of Romans 12 actually begins with a call to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, as our true and proper worship. And it tells us not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But these few verses that we're going to focus on today offer guidance and instruction for how to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, as followers of Jesus, loving when it costs something. These are all very countercultural to a patterned world that models loving someone when it's convenient for you, or sharing only when you have excess, or serving others only when it also benefits you in some way. So the reason I chose to read verses 9 through 13 is because it provides some foundation for how we're called to love and serve. And it begins with what love is, right? Love must be sincere. And I think that statement drives the rest of this instruction. Love is genuine. It is without hypocrisy. This means it cannot be faked. This sincere love is what we are given, right? It's what we receive from God. Love is what drove Jesus to the cross for us. And now we love because he has first loved us. We love out of the love that we were given. Our two greatest commands we've probably heard are to love God and to love others, and all of our actions should flow out of that love. Love is always a choice. It's always something you have to choose to do, and it's not always an easy one, as we'll talk about. But I'm going to go through the rest of the passage again. We're going to do something a little bit different, and I want you to reflect on how you've seen someone model these things for you or how you've been a recipient of love or service in this way, or maybe how you've even practiced them yourselves. But I want you to pay attention to what stands out. Maybe it's a specific memory or a specific person, and then ask God why this memory, why this person is standing out to you. So we're going to go through these kind of slowly. So I want you to think uh, and ponder on what you've experienced or how you've experienced these in your life. So the second half of verse 9 reads, Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. We don't celebrate or even tolerate evil. We reject it as it stands in opposition to goodness and to love. We cling to what is good. We don't define what's good based on what makes us feel good, but we see that God is good. We see that faithfulness. And we know that he supplies everything that is good. So how do we cling to his goodness? Has someone ever reminded you of God's goodness or even shared their own testimony of how they've experienced it? It says, be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. This means outdo each other in love, care for each other, honor and give weight to the concerns of other people. What does it look like to truly value someone or to be committed to loving people? those inside your community and those outside of your community. How have you experienced someone giving you honor or showing you care when your needs were placed above their own? Never be lacking in zeal, 
but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Draw near to God, abide in him so that you do not lose that desire to do his will and to love others. Be diligent in serving God and serving his people. Have you ever experienced someone that is just so excited about all that God is doing, whether it's for them or in their lives or it's just around them, but then it spurs them on to want to love and serve even more? Those are the people that just have endless energy to keep serving. Um, and the, the reason is because that's what actually gives them energy. Those are the people I love to be around. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Rejoice in the hope that we have in Jesus, even when you face suffering or trials. Be patient because of the hope that we have and remain in prayer constantly consistently in times of suffering, in times of rejoicing. What does faithful prayer look like for you in both joy and in affliction? As we remember God's faithfulness and we anticipate or we await his future promises. Have you ever had to hold on to hope when you were suffering or had someone pray for you when you just couldn't pray yourself? Have you seen someone experience long suffering and persevere with patience and hope, only explained because God was providing them with comfort. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Share because there is a need, not just because you have something left over to give. Hospitality is welcoming others into your space, into your life, into your family or your group of friends. How can you share what you have with those who need it? Whether it's resources, time, energy, or your community, how have you been provided for or shown hospitality? I know for me, God has consistently shown up through other people that he's used to encourage me, to pray for me, to show me hospitality and point me back to remembering his goodness even when things just don't feel good. And a lot of this happened uh, while I was in college. I lived six hours away from family when I came to college and I wasn't even 18 for the whole first year. So I was trying to figure it out all on my own uh, and God and his goodness surrounded me with just the best community. From my roommates to professors and staff members that offered encouragement and guidance and even friends, families that became like my own family that lived nearby, they always offered a home-cooked meal or an oasis off campus. The people that I was surrounded by knew how to love and serve people well because they chose to love and they allowed God to work through them. And they impacted my life and I know the lives of many others at the same time. But the world does not prioritize loving or serving people above serving ourselves. Yet this is what God calls us into, right? This countercultural, different way of living in the world. So much so that we should be marked by how we love and serve people well. Dorothy Day, who, if you don't know, was a writer, journalist, activist. She was the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. Uh, wrote about loving differently, a little bit like this. She wrote about the way the world loves and said, we don't want to pay the cost of love. We do not want to exercise our capacity to love. Basically, she's saying that love costs something and that cost is uncomfortable. It's a hard cost to pay. Sometimes it hurts or there's an emotional toll and we don't want to offer up what's necessary to pay it. But here's what this means for us. First, we have to acknowledge that sincere love does come with a cost. It takes effort, it takes time, it takes energy, and sometimes it even takes resources that we may not have a lot of. But I also love that she noted that we have this capacity to love, even though we don't wanna exercise it. We are capable of sincere love, whether or not that you feel that you've been shown it by other people. Even if you are tired, even if you are burnt out or stretched thin, you still have capacity to love because of the love that's been given to you. 
Don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you to go throw out all of your personal boundaries and neglect yourself for the sake of loving others. If we ever meet on one, you know that I will encourage you to set those personal boundaries. But I think those right boundaries in place don't diminish your capacity to love, but they actually expand it. In one of her stories, Dorothy shares about someone offering hospitality to a stranger, and rather than it ending with gratitude like they had hoped for, they were stolen from. But she still said, we must love to the point of folly, because that's how our Lord loves us. His love and his sacrifice does not make sense when we think about how often we reject him or neglect to be thankful for what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us. And I think the way that we love people should be different from how the world expects us to love people. It shouldn't just make sense if it's actually costing us something. Jesus loved differently, and it didn't always make sense in his context either. A couple of weeks ago, we heard from Deb and PJ as they shared about the woman in the well uh, at, on, in John 4. Uh, that's one of my favorite passages in all of the Gospels because it shows how Jesus was willing to cross so many barriers in order to love this woman and to reveal himself to her as the Messiah. He crossed barriers of race and gender and social status that a Jewish male rabbi would have been expected to keep at the time. And in doing so, this woman's life was changed forever, right? And many of her own town even uh, had their lives changed as a result of her testimony and meeting and encountering Jesus. Jesus loved and served the people that were right in front of him, from his disciples and friends to his family and his neighbors. But he also traveled to places outside of his community, and he loved and he served them too. He loved people that shared his religious and cultural background, and he loved those were, that were seemingly in opposition to everything that he was, his religion and culture. And he, of course, gave the ultimate loving sacrifice for us on the cross and through his resurrection, but he also showed love through his words and actions daily. And I think we can look to that example of him, of meeting both physical and spiritual needs. So as we reflected earlier about how you've experienced love in those different ways, whether you witnessed it in someone else, or you received it, or you've practiced it yourself in some way, think back about what stood out to you. Is there something about those loving acts that you can thank God for, that can you, you can remember his goodness and his faithfulness in? Maybe you were served by someone and it just made no sense why they would help you in that way. Maybe you felt valued by someone as they showed you empathy for what you were going through. Maybe someone invited you into their home and served you a meal, or someone just prayed for you. How can you remember those ways in which God showed up for you and how he showed up through other people? How can remembering his faithfulness in your own life, whether it's big or small, now spur you on to joyfully anticipate what he's still yet to do? I think maybe what he's still yet to do through you for somebody else. We're back to outreach. In local and global outreach at Jessup, our goal is to love and serve all and to give you all the opportunities to do that while also in community. So loving and serving all means everyone from your roommate to the person on campus that you never talk to but that you always see around to the families five minutes from campus who need weekly food assistance to help feed their children or to the refugees dispersed all over the world seeking safety, some in our own backyard, and to the young girls in Cambodia who are desperate for someone to offer genuine love and affection for them. There's more than enough opportunity for you to practice loving and serving your community, whether that's on campus, that's off campus, or that's overseas in cross-cultural ministry. There are a lot of people to love and serve here in our area of Rockland or Sacramento, and there's a lot that are outside of our community too. There's opportunities to serve when you're comfortable and when you're really uncomfortable. In local outreach at Jessup, we give you the opportunity to meet the needs of people in your current context, just a few miles from campus. 
And in Global Outreach, we provide you with the opportunity to travel to different places in a very different way than as a tourist or somebody going on vacation so that you can also encounter God in these new ways and experience the kingdom of God at work in different contexts from your own. You will practice loving and serving people that look, act, and believe very differently than you, and it will expand your worldview, quite literally. There is need both globally and locally, and if you're a follower of Jesus, you are called to reflect the love that God has shown you and participate in his kingdom. Now, as we remember and reflect on his goodness and the faithfulness, if you have a story about how God has worked in your life or how he's revealed himself to you in some way, and if you're a follower of Jesus, then I know that you do have a story, then you have a testimony that can and should be shared. I invite you to share Jesus' love with people with both your words of what, what he's done in your life and your actions to meet those needs. You have so much to offer, and you have so much capacity to love people. So let's do it together. Y'all know what to do to get involved with outreach on campus. You can come find me. You can talk with our campus men staff or interns. Uh, to sign up. You can go to our website and all of those things, which you know. But don't let, let the opportunity pass you by when there's just so much that God can do with you. So thank you. I will pray, uh, and then you'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for the constant love and the grace that you pour out on us. Thank you for the people that you've placed in our lives for us to love and for the ones that have shown us love. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve communities here, serve them all over the globe. Lead us, God, to the places and the people that you have for us to serve and love and give us the energy, God, to serve well. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done and all that you are and all that you continue to do. Amen.